Thank you for joining today's webinar, Biomass Energy Systems on Economics and Finance. Our presenters today have been brought together to share information about the financial aspects of building and financing a biomass energy system. They will cover various incentives and grants available to assist, and we want our audience to be aware of them as resources for the future in reference to projects that are envisioned, designed, financed, and eventually constructed. Before we get started, we'd like to take care of a few technical housekeeping items. Our webinars are um, being managed by Zoom. We're gonna do um, the normal Zoom protocol. Please use the chat box for technical support. If you have questions, we ask that you submit them via the Q&A feature or by raising your hand during the discussion at the end of the presentation via the chat um, feature. Polling questions will be used during today's session. We're gonna do these live polls. To answer a poll question, you can click on the radio button next to your answer and then click submit. We'd like to do a practice poll question to get a little information about the size of the group joining us today. Tell us about how many people are with you that are watching the webinar. Remember to answer a poll question, click on the radio button next to your answer, and the results from our poll will now be showing on your screen, and we'll be using the poll feature a couple times today during the program. So it's just you for this group all together. Great. So we have one more poll question. How would you best describe your role as an attendee for today's session? Please select all the options that apply. If you choose other, we ask that you please provide some additional information about your role via the chat box. Remember to answer a question, click on the radio button next to your answers and then hit submit. After a few seconds, we'll close the poll and you'll see the results. Very good. A broad cross spectrum of people. This webinar is the final in a session of our 2020 Biomass Energy Series. Recordings of each session and additional resources are available online at mdcleanenergy.org slash biomass. Webinar attendees can receive one continuing edu forestry education credit from the Society of American Foresters for each session that they attend. Other credential holders may also be able to self-report this series to meet continuing education requirements. At the end of today's session, Zoom will open a survey page in the attendees' browsers after leaving the webinar. Please submit the form to ensure that we have your correct information for continuing education credit reporting and verification. If you need assistance reporting continuing education hours, please email info at mdcleanenergy.org. This program is offered in association with the Spurring Fossil Free Biomass Initiative, brought to you by the Maryland Forestry Foundation, the Maryland Clean Energy Center, in partnership with the Maryland Department of Natural Resources and the Sustainable Forestry Council. We'd like to thank the partners who have organized this series and want to acknowledge funding by the Maryland Agriculture Education and Rural Development Assistance Fund for the program. So great, let's get started. We have a wonderful lineup of speakers today. At the end of the program, we will have time for Q&A. Please remember that questions for the panelists can be submitted throughout the program via the Q&A feature at any time during the presentation and you can use the chat box. Using woody biomass for energy has neutral impacts on carbon emissions when the right policy and regulatory framework are in place. It's important for educated stakeholders to work together to create sound policies and regulations for the harvest and use of woody, of woody biomass for energy. In this webinar, participants will gain a broader understanding of what does it cost to build, install, and operate a woody biomass energy system, what is the expected return on investment from installed biomass energy systems? 
How can these systems be financed affordably and conveniently? Which grants, incentives, and renewable energy credits are available to assist with project financing? And what is the qualification process for the existing thermal renewable energy credit? Our first presenter today is Wyatt Shiflett. He's the Director of Finance Programs and my colleague at the Maryland Clean Energy Center. Mr. Shiflett is working to deliver project finance solutions to assist clients in achieving cost-effective funding. Wyatt has assisted Maryland-based universities, college, hospitals, hotels, retirement communities, manufacturers, charter schools, and other 501c3 organizations, issuing over $3 billion in tax-exempt project financing throughout his career. He has served as the Assistant Director of the Maryland Health and Higher Education Financing Facilities Authority, the Deputy Director at Maryland Industrial Finance Authority, and the Assistant Director of Bond Financing at the Maryland Economic Development Corporation. Prior to working in the public sector, Mr. Shiflett worked as an investment advisory capacity at Morgan Stanley and an investment banking capacity at J.P. Morgan. Wyatt's experience in the capital markets, along with his ability to work creatively to find innovative solutions, are a strength. He has an MBA in finance from the University of Notre Dame and a Bachelor of Science degree from Towson University with a major in business administration and a concentration in finance. Good morning, Wyatt. Good morning, Kathy. Good morning, group. I'm excited to present today. Um, thank you for joining. The, I have about 10 minutes, so I think we're going to keep it pretty broad, but feel free to reach out to me at any point after this webinar. Um, I'm, I'm found easily um, through Google or through, on our website at MCEC, um, and I take great pride in providing some education around these topics, so I'm happy to spend as much time with you as needed after the webinar as well. Before we go into the, the, the list here on the slide, I just want to talk briefly about project finance and the two you know, ways that I see these type of projects being financed. One is you're selling a system to someone and it's their responsibility to pay for the system, whether they use cash, whether they finance it. An example would be if you sell a system, the Johns Hopkins Health System. You know, and, and you show them projections and it meets their IRR criteria and it, it, it's something that they want to do, then they're in charge of making the finance decision about how to pay for that system. You know, a, a second way to do it is sort of energy as a service, which is very popular these days as, as people are cash strapped and budgets are very tight. You also can deliver someone a service that they pay for over time. Um, similar to the PPA model um, and solar development, where a developer, um, someone other than the one benefiting from the performance of the assets, owns the assets. And they, in turn, are responsible for financing those assets. So there, there's two sides of this, but I think the, the presentation works for either side. Think about where you are in that spectrum. Um, and I'm sure there's hybrids, but those are two really polar opposite views of one, someone's buying it on their own credit, and one, the developer has to finance it themselves. Um, so first thing we wanted to talk about in the section of the agenda was titled Proformas and Financing um, is your financial performance. And I've had some experience at the Clean Energy Center working with a um, potential pilot Woody Biomass project at Harford County Public Schools. Um, and when we came to analyze the project, it became very clear that we needed to dig deeper at all the costs. Uh, there was a cost of the system and to store wood to, and the hopper size and different things that needed to be vetted for the cost of daily delivery, a smaller system, but daily delivery of the feedstock. And those costs really need to be vetted much more than they were to make it bankable or to even to make a customer comfortable with a IRR decision. What's my rate of return here? I'm gonna put capital out, I'm gonna save here, but you know, how do I give information to my decision makers? So I just wanna you know, caution the whole group to really think through, it doesn't ben any, benefit anyone to hide any cost, um, even in, inadvertently, um, really think through all the costs that are associated with the project, whether it's maintenance or insurance, um, you know, th there's lots of costs that are you know, 
service related, maintenance related that, that aren't indicative of just a purchase price for a piece of equipment. One thing I would say in your pro forma is document the assumptions. Um, if you're gonna finance something um, and it's a large asset, you're looking for financing terms to sync up with the useful life of the asset. So this could be 15 year projections, 20 year projections. Um, we're all familiar with the home mortgage analogy, right? The, the longer you finance something, the lower your annual costs are, the more interest you're paying. But sometimes it's beneficial to take a long term to make a project cash flow, but you need to document your assumptions. And that would include for the life of the project. It gets harder as you go further out to have predictability and certainty in your assumptions. But nevertheless, you need to document them, footnote them, and make the performance more believable. Um, and in that, in that light, the use of case studies, already existing documents, third-party studies, things of that nature. And I know DNR has a lot of studies about the availability of wood waste. Um, things like that are gonna play into a financing, especially if you need to get external financing. Um, the, the banks are going to care about that. Um, there's a difference between an equity investor and a uh, debt investor. An equity investor might share some risk with you, take these risks. Um, they're going to be looking for return um, as far as profitability and sharing of the um, cash flows or sharing of the net profits. That's an equity investor. They'll take more risk. But a debt investor, similar to your mortgage analogy, is going to usually want a fixed rate of return payment at defined periods of time, and they're going to want to buy into these projections. They, they don't want a project that maybe can't get the fee stock or doesn't have an offtake, that doesn't have contracts for these things, that the contracts aren't bankable, they're not believable. There, there's, a, there's a level of due diligence of the credit worthiness of the people you're contracting with, not just you, the developer, um, you know, the offtaker. If the offtaker is a going concern and might not be in business in five years, Maybe that's not as strong as a contract as if the off-taker is a government entity. Um, so I think that's enough on pro formas. I think we've all done them, but that's just a, a little guidance. And, and I've seen good ones and I've seen bad ones. Um, and if you have to do a feasibility study on your own, there will be a substantial cost that you need to bake into the project and understand who pays for that cost. Usually the people that do these third-party studies aren't vested in the project success. They could be, but it's rare. They want to get paid for their time and their effort in real time. It's not like we'll push that to be a cost to be financed if we finance something a year from now. That's more of a, de a developer's mindset, but it's, it's not likely that um, someone that does a study is going to be of the same mindset. They just want to get paid in real time. Uh, as far as project finance, um, I listed some really relevant things. We all know this, uh, but cash flow. It, it goes into your pro formas. You're going to have to show the cash flow, the net benefit, um, that it's going to be really important um, if you're trying to finance it yourself or even for your customer to see the, the ultimate benefit. Um, so cash flow. Um, collateral equally is important if you're going for debt financing. Um, you know, if you are a startup entity, that may include personal guarantees, IDOTs, things of that nature. If you're a large organization, then the collateral almost goes to the third bullet point of credit. You know, what's your existing credit history? Um, if a lot of banks will be comfortable if you have a strong credit history. You probably should go to your existing bank. Um, if this is too specialty and nuanced financing, you go elsewhere, but they know you best. Um, but that, that's a big part of it. It's not just cash flow. Banks, they're worried about one, like, can you pay? That's the cash flow. But next is, can I make you pay? right? Can they take the equipment back? Is there value in the equipment? Um, some of these projects, it, it might not be as valuable as you think if a bank takes it back and tries to resell it on the open market. Different than a home or an automobile, which has pretty high collateral value. Um, so that, that's can I make you pay if the deal goes sour. Um, and then credit is your history of paying. How comfortable are they? And the character part is important. Um, if you're a startup entity in particular, they need to get a sense of your know, credibility and your willingness to pay. You know, will you pay? Will you do the right thing? Will you pay um, on your obligations? Um, so I mean, that's really high level. 
Um, but it all has to be done. And then you don't want to start negotiating without understanding the collateral piece. You know, a bank isn't going to be comfortable just with the cash flow. Your projections look great. We're good. And, you know, a bank's going to want, and a debt investor is going to want collateral. An equity investor could be different. They could see your cash flow projections, see a lot of upside, and really want to partner with you with the hope of that upside built on your financial performance. I want to talk briefly about MCEC's financing programs that layer into this. For those of you that aren't familiar, there's a Maryland PACE program that was stood up by MCEC. Um, it's in most of the counties in the state. Very good website. You can explore it. Um, if you run into a project in the county that hasn't adopted PACE yet, it's only a few, reach out to Kathy and I. It's always a great impetus to advance legislation when there's a real project. Um, you know, mo most counties in Maryland do have a PACE program, uh, but this is a chance for a commercial property owner to finance a project at advantageous terms, long terms, and they can do it through a assessment on their property tax. It's a voluntary assessment on their property tax, and they basically pay back the underpinning of the financing through the collection of property taxes. It's an effective mechanism. We have a whole team built around PACE in the state that can work with you. If a customer thinks that's the way that they wanna pay for project development, um, it could be very effective. Um, the other thing I wanna highlight is we have an MCAP program, Maryland Clean Energy Capital. Um, I put down here taxes on bond issuance. It can be taxable, um, but you wanna do as much as you can on a tax exempt basis because it's a lower borrowing cost. It's lower interest. Um, the, the banks or whoever is issuing the debt will take a lower interest rate because the income's tax-free. It works out for all sides. They get income that they don't have to pay taxes on. The project itself gets a lower interest rate. So we're gonna focus right now on the tax exempt side of this, but MCC does issue taxable bonds. Um, the entity itself that's doing the purchasing can qualify for tax exempt status. Um, so if your customer was a government or your customer was a not-for-profit, they in and of themselves could qualify for taxes and bond status if they were going to own the assets and, and be the uh, you know, responsible party for the debt. Um, on the flip side, the IRS does have provisions when you're dealing with waste. You know, if you're taking waste, you know, and you're out of the waste stream, you, often you can finance that on a tax exempt basis. And that could be a private activity bond. Uh, the, the owner could be a private entity. The, the person that takes on the debt could be a private entity that qualifies through the IRS for private activity bonds. That's a much lengthier discussion than we have time for today, but know that that's a possibility and it's a pretty quick vetting screen. If you think that you, you, know, you qualify for that or you wanna talk through that, just reach out to me. Pretty quick vetting to see if it truly is waste and, and it could be parts of your project qualify for tax exempt financing and parts qualify for taxable. Um, and based on the size, it could be worth it. You know, anything over 5 million, um, you really want to start looking hard at tax exempt. 10 million, it's a no brainer. Really small projects, it doesn't make sense to go tax exempt because there's a level of IRS reporting. There's a level of additional legal cost for bond councils to have to make opinions on tax exempt bonds. So there is a threshold for project size, know that. Um, but if you have a larger project, you know, five, $10 million north of 10 million, you definitely want to explore tax exempt bonds and we're happy to explore that with you. The last thing I bring up is RECs and credits. Um, sometimes there's tax credits, the legislation um, goes in and out or the funding may go in and out. But as far as financing and performance, you want to know the predictability of that. You know, the bank's going to care about that. You should care about that if you're the developer. There's always the ability to monetize something up front. Um, you may not get the full value if you hold it for 15 years, but it may be more certainty of the, the cash flow in year one because you're not subject to a change in rec prices or a change in um, public policy for tax credits. So that's always something to consider. Um, it, it's a strategic decision. It, it's really, you know, how, how much do you think they'll be valuable in the future and do you want to take on that risk of that being devalued in the future or increase value in the future, or do you want to pass that risk to someone else? In passing that risk, they will pay you um, less money because they're taking on risk, but you might have the certainty of an upfront payment. So I think that's all that my time allows for. But once again, I do encourage you to reach out to the Clean Energy Center. 
um, after the webinar if you have a project in development and want to talk to this in greater detail. Thank you, Wyatt. I'm sure we'll have some questions for you at the end of the session. Our next presenter is Gary Amy. Gary is the Energy Program Manager for Biomass, EM&V Contact Manager for the Maryland Energy Administration. Gary was born in Haiti, but he followed his wife from Boston to Maryland. Gary currently serves um, at MEA, where he oversees the Biomass Energy Program, the Game Changer Grants, the Net Zero Schools, and the Evaluation, Measurement, and Verification for State Energy Program con Contractors. He is also MEA's delegate for the American Association of Blacks in Energy and the Minority Business Enterprise Representative. Previously, he served as the Combined Heat and Power and Animal Waste to Energy Program Manager. He's a frequent energy speaker and presented at a variety of events in Maryland and th throughout the U.S. Good morning, Gary, and welcome. I take my name off the mute. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, um, Kathy, for the introduction. And then also thank you, Riot, for um, mentioning some of the great um, finance program out there. Well, I'm going to go a little bit. Um, my slide is a little long. I'm trying to be as brief as I can. Again, my name is Gary. I oversee the um, biomass um, program in, in Maryland. Um, next slide, please. Um, so just to give you all a, a, a quick understanding of, of Maryland, we are a small agency. What I mean by small, I mean that we have about less than about 35 employees in our office, but our mission is very large. What I mean by that is our mission is at Maryland is to provide affordable, reliable, clean energy uh, rebates um, for our um, all Marylanders. Next slide. So to go back and just to give you a quick understanding what, what I'm doing right now with the biomass, my focus, not just on the commercial side, but I'm also focused on the residential side as well. So what we are doing, we are helping home, home Maryland, homeowners in Maryland to invest in energy. And what MEA is doing, we're providing rebates to clean uh, burning wood and pallet stove that displace electric and non-natural fossil fuel for heating purposes. So back in 2012, uh, we start off with the wood stove about $400 per homeowner, uh, and then for the pallet it was 600. And I noticed that the program was getting more very, very popular. And recently I increased it, the wood um, stove to $500 per home resident, and for the pallets of about 700. So if you look at it totally since 2012 up to date, uh, we've awarded over $2,857,000 of uh, grants through the uh, biomass program for residential. Next slide. So the, the, the purpose of, of, of this is to make sure that we follow the EPA guidelines. And all wood stove that you are from residential that you purchase, they must meet the EPA published efficiency ratings uh, which is about 70%. Um, and also, uh, it may not emit no more than three gram per particular matter per hour. And the, all the wood stoves that when you, when an applicant sent to Maryland, they all go through a, 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 a certified process with our uh, energy specialists. And from that point on, that's how we award some of these grants. And as far as the, uh, uh, wood stove that may not emit no more than two grand for particular matter per hour. Next, next slide, please. So as I stated before, the whole uh, purpose of this was to uh, provide an alternative heating for uh, displace for non-natural fossil fuel heating systems. And we also provide uh, this rebate for individuals who are replacing old stove as well. And one of the criteria in Maryland that you must be a primary residence of Maryland. And some of the, I'm gonna not throw out Allegheny counties, but Allegheny County, for example, do not have any uh, permits requirements. But for those who do have requirements, we wanna make sure that you follow the NF and NFI certified contractors. And also you must make sure that you pull all the requirements, permits, and make sure that it passed inspection. Next slide, please. 
So some of the difficulties that I and I see through my um, energy specialists when they come up and give me some of the complaints is that some of the residents at times cannot determine if they whether the stove is on the list of the EPA list or, um, or not. And what, what I do is that I tend to send the whole list to the um, contractors to make sure that they follow the EPA guideline efficiency for pallet stoves and wood stove. And some of the times um, people miss and disregard the particular matters limit requirement. And then that can also have an impact of you receiving the biomass grants. Uh, and also the, some of the contractors are, are not um, certified as well. So one of the things I, I advise everyone is that, is that uh, to make sure that you follow all the permits requirement. Next slide, please. So what are, what are the requirements that, I, that, that, that is required in order to get your rebate? One is that you make sure the application is completely filled out. And you must show proof that the, the, the stove is paid in full, you have a zero balance. And you must send us a copy of all the documentation inspection that is required. And then mainly, some of the things sometimes that is missed, we want to see a copy of that stove uh, installed into your home. And also that you must show proof that you are a primary residence um, owner of the property. Next slide, please. So uh, one of the things that I also want to talk about, this is from a residential standpoint, for the commercial standpoint is that, and I myself, and I believe that, and then also with MEA, we believe that a uh, wood product industry in terms of biomass makes a lot of sense. So back in 2016, um, we started off a pilot program, the commercial um, boiler program. And we offered it at about a 50% cost match. Um, and that subsequently ran into 2017. And we awarded about a million dollars in grants on that. So, and those grants were awarded to three applicants, two on the Eastern Shore, and then uh, one in Baltimore City. Unfortunately, that some of these projects did not move forward. And some of it could be, as Ryan just mentioned, it could be from a finance standpoint, it could be from a feasibility study standpoint. And then, so all these projects, unfortunately, um, pulled out for different financial, also some internal reasons. Uh, quickly, I know I have about a few seconds left. I want to go over some fun facts with you all um, as far as Maryland. Um, in Maryland, uh, forests, uh, we have about over 100 million tons of carbon in Maryland. And that pool is, is increasingly um, yearly. The forest industry in Maryland, basically in the Maryland area, basically encompasses about seven uh, Maryland counties. Approximately about 300 landowners sell timbers annually in Maryland. Uh, two thirds of saw timber, which is the highest grade, and also in Maryland. And young forests are declining throughout the Maryland, um, about 20% of that is basically going to what you call commercial housing. So my point here is also to talk about why MEA is in the forefront of pushing these grant incentives to promote biomass, but I also want to uh, offer a little of uh, support to the biomass industry is that we are here to support the industry but also that we're also here to um, highlight some of the great things we're doing. And we also need you all help to continue to push viable projects when it comes to commercial biomass in Maryland that will help us in the state agency and others in the private sector as well to continue to promote, to promote biomass. And I hope that able to highlight some of the work that MEA is doing from a residential standpoint and potentially the there's a large opportunity from a commercial as well. And for that, I'll leave it for any questions. Gary, we have one question for you. Is this the only biomass program offered through the governor's office of MEA? Have there been any other Woody biomass efforts? As of right now, this is the only one that was offered um, through the 
uh, Department of um, Maryland Energy Administration with the residential. Now, there's also some other programs that's out there. What I think uh, one of uh, Wright might have mentioned it, I think someone mentioned it before, with the CHP um, project, the combined heat and power, where you can actually use the wood feedstock as well to, um, to use that for the thermal racks as well. And there's how much funding is available in that program for 2021? For the CHP or the commercial biomass? In the, in both actually. Uh, right, 2021, a good point here. We just closed out our 2020 fiscal year. Uh, but 2021, and I think right now we're probably close to probably $4 million um, uh, for the CHP program. And the um, the biomass, same? Well, list. the biomass, again, uh, for the residential standpoint, we have um, close to, uh, this year, we've had close to about over a million dollars for the residential for this year. And potentially, I think, um, there's a good opportunity for us to look at commercially what we can offer. And then that's a good question, Kath, in terms of commercially-wise, what is the industry is, is seeing out there so it can help me to basically to promote a program for commercial biomass as well. Okay, um, thank you. And uh, we have one comment from an anonymous attendee. This is the biomass programs need to provide to find suitable biomass not have an answer for that now, but we, we will keep that one on the burner while we move to our next speaker. Um, in the interest of time, I'm pleased to introduce our next speaker. Bruce Weaver is the State Energy Coordinator and Program Specialist at the USDA Rural Development. Mr. Weaver retired from banking after 25 years in 2004 and has been with the USDA ever since. He is the State Energy Coordinator for both Maryland and Delaware, as well as a Program Specialist in several other grant and loan programs. Those programs entail business loan guarantees for local banks, value-added grants for farms and businesses, and development grants for rural towns and not-for-profits. Good morning, Bruce. Welcome. Good morning, Kathy. Uh, thank you. Um, as Kathy said, uh, I am the State Energy Coordinator for Delaware and Maryland. If there are any folks on the webinar this morning uh, who are from states other than those two, um, there I have a counterpart representing each of the other states uh, throughout the country. Um, I have two programs uh, that I'm going to address this morning. Um, one program I work in all the time, and that is called our Rural Energy for America program. Uh, the program started in 2003. Uh, at the time, it was a grant-only program. In 2005, and we branched out, and we added a loan part to the to the program. Um, that would be a guaranteed loan, where USDA will guarantee a portion of the loan for um, a local bank or even a bank that is uh, from another state. Um, the program initially, it, it was designed primarily for uh, farms and rural small businesses. Um, this program is not eligible for uh, nonprofits, uh, state bodies, community bodies. Um, no type of government entity would be eligible for the Rural Energy for America program. Um, we also do not um, take uh, do housing with this program either. It's strictly the farm operation and rural businesses. Um, this particular grant program, um, I think this year we had somewhere around $9.6 million in grants nationwide. Um, the grants are broken down into two different buckets of money for each state. Uh, one is for grants that would be for less $20,000 or less. Another would be for grants of 
uh, over $20,000. Uh, the for Delaware uh, this year we had about $128,000 uh, in grants uh, funds available for grants under $20,000. And in Maryland, we had 149,000 for grants under 20. Uh, for the grants, that would be for over 20,000. We had 483,000 in Delaware and 656,000 in uh, Maryland. Um, the small grant uh, bucket of funds typically has been the same for quite a few years. Uh, the funds for the larger grants that did increase this year uh, went up by hundred by one hundred fifty thousand dollars in uh, uh, in Delaware and almost two hundred thousand in uh, increase for uh, for Maryland. But in looking at those numbers, um, all of the projects are going to be your typical small business or the farm. Um, we had a total of 20 grants for both states for under uh, over 20,000. The average grant was 53,000. Um, the average grant for uh, the 17 under $20,000 projects that we did um, or grant amounts that we did uh, averaged about $16,000. Um, where some of the larger funding can take place is in the guaranteed loan program. Um, most of the, almost all, all of the grant requests that come in, we cover 25% uh, of the project costs with that grant. The customer is responsible for the other 75%. 98% uh, uh, of the grants that come in are for solar. Um, we will have some energy efficiency projects such as grain dryers for farmers and lighting for, uh, for business uh, facilities. Um, and virtually every one of those customers has already gone out to their uh, to their bank or to maybe their farm credit office, and they've already obtained the funding for the project uh, before I even know there's a grant request coming in. Um, although I have done a couple of these uh, guaranteed loans for banks, uh, both were for sale, solar projects, uh, both were in Maryland. Uh, the one in Maryland was about a $532,000 uh, guaranteed loan for a local bank. And the one in Maryland was $4.8 million for a bank in North Carolina that did a 50-acre a solar field in uh, outside of uh, Pawneetown, Maryland. Um, under the REAP program, the maximum grant, maximum loan would be $25 million. Um, I'm not sure exactly how much some of these projects cost. I've seen some small numbers. I've seen some very huge numbers. Um, but we can do uh, guaranteed loans with local banks, providing them a guarantee for these projects. Um, However, the, the same premise holds true for the guaranteed loans under the REIT program as it does for the grants. And those loans, guaranteed loans, are only for um, the uh, rural farms or small businesses uh, that are for profit businesses, they're not nonprofits or public bodies. Um, that said, we also have another uh, program. Um, I don't specifically work in this program. I know the folks in Washington that do. Um, I have been part of discussions with some customers uh, as recently as, as last year um, that were looking for um, bioenergy projects. Um, I was involved in working with Washington on three different rather large uh, 60 million plus uh, anaerobic digester projects. Um, the 9003 program, which is what they call it, um, they have a significantly uh, more money than the REAP program does. Um, 
and based on the size of the project um, and the amount of funds being requested, um, then the decision would be made, is this going to be better suited to do the REIT program or the 9003? Um, I believe uh, Wyatt had said earlier, um, had, had discussed, um, you know, investments and, and money coming from investors. Um, the project that we did uh, for the $4.8 million uh, out in uh, Tonytown, that was actually about a $14 million total project. Um, and a little over, just under 10 million of that was coming from investors. Uh, so there are definitely investors out there um, that are looking for projects, looking for a way to invest their funds um, into some type of a uh, an energy project. Um, and there's certainly plenty of those around. Uh, I myself have not done anything with the woody biomass. Uh, I have talked with people about doing those projects for other re reasons that I'm not completely aware of. Those projects just have not, you know, gone through. Um, but again, if there are any questions, I know that uh, Kathy, uh, she has uh, email and phone number information. Um, I'll entertain calls or emails from anybody that has any more any questions on uh, on either of the, the two USDA programs. And I thank you. Bruce, thank you so much. Um, just a couple questions for you from me. What are the eligibility criteria to be considered rural for these programs? Okay, uh, good question. Uh, the rural definition for USDA is um, you have to have a population of 50,000 people or less. Um, in Maryland, uh, specifically uh, the city of Waldorf, is not eligible. Frederick City is not eligible. Obviously, Baltimore City, and you could have um, areas that would be considered adjacent to those specific uh, populations. That just because of their proximity to them, they would also be considered um, not eligible. I mean, I actually had a project uh, a year ago where the the um, the project uh, was 20 miles south of Wilmington, Delaware, but because of the proximity to Delaware, and it was in Maryland, it was not eligible. Um, so that sprawling population from the cities does affect in some cases, but for the most part in Maryland, those would be the only ones that we would not be able to entertain. Okay. And then another question, can a project developer use grant funds for project feasibility study and design? No, cannot. It used to be an eligible purpose some years ago, but it no longer is. Okay, great. Um, I think that's it for questions for Bruce, we have a question for Wyatt. Um, is it necessary to have a feasibility study from a third party to get financing for a project? No, it's not, um, but it, it's primarily the, the bank's call or decision if the data and information presented to them is, is credible and, and passes their, their standards. But no, it's not a requirement, um, it, but it could be after you get into it. And you can always shop around for lenders. Um, same thing with an investor too, um, but it's, it's definitely not a, a hard and fast requirement. Um, I always say try and leverage things that are out there. If you can leverage information that's already out there, um, that could get some, some comfort level and, and maybe get some issues over the hump with a lender, but it is not a requirement. And then the other question does, does MCEC help find lenders? We can. Um, that, that would be a service that we would have to charge for. We'd have to come up with a specific scope of work. We're in this for the advancement of clean energy. 
So if it's really easy to make a connection, we'll obviously do that at no charge. Um, but if it's, it's just really exhaustive, like you're trying to find um, the lowest cost funding, if you want to issue an RFP um, or you're, 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 you're using us to help find the most attractive terms, that would be something that we would work out a, a fee for service arrangement. But just to introduce you to a few banks, we're happy to do that. Thank you. And then a question for Gary. Gary, what is the most significant challenge that biomass energy projects face that keeps them from moving forward? And I think what Riot is, is touching, that's what it is, is the finance um, side of it. That's what keeps it from moving forward. And also the feasibility study. And I think someone asked about the third party. And then those, those things have to be done um, um, very carefully. And then the performal numbers have to be to a point where the, you have a great return of investment. And it's not a short-term project. And I think Ryan talked about that. We talked about 15, 20 years projecting of, of your return on investment. So I think the key point uh, to that question is, is the investment side of it. But not necessarily access to feedstock for these projects. That is correct. We have plenty of feedstocks in Maryland. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yeah. And then Kathy, if I can chime in, I think you know, it's a long held belief with all these technologies, not just biomass, but the, you, know, you need the, the cutting edge, you need the, the, the early adopters, but it's refined over time and the economics get better, the solar industry, right? The economics get better and better where maybe you need less subsidy over time, but early on, you know, sometimes there's a certain amount of subsidy that needs to be fought for that's more public policy than finance, but it intertwines, you know? And so if you do have some incentives, it, it could be the tipping point for some projects, but to Gary's point, um, no amount of subsidy or no amount of grant is gonna make something that's not feasible, feasible. That's uh, but but to, there's a confluence of all that. And I, I think the industry's there, uh, but it's great to have case studies. I don't think I mentioned that before. I had it on my slide. But you know, case studies are great. Success breeds success. I mean, we sometimes you just need to do a demonstration. You need to do a pilot, um, and sometimes that's a different kind of financing. Maybe it's someone that cares about the success of the project. Maybe it's mission-driven capital. Um, maybe it's even ex more expensive capital. Uh, but you need success, and then you can build upon that. Great point, Wyatt. Um, Wyatt, can you? talk a little bit about a federal tax credit that's available for biomass projects? I'm really not the resource. I, I, I would hate to steer someone in the wrong direction. I can follow up with information. Well, in fairness to the group, I mean, we haven't seen a lot of biomass projects come our way. So we've never had to roll up our sleeves and dive that deep. Um, but there is one. There is a, a tax credit available on the federal level. Like I said, I'll, I'll get information to folks that need it. Okay, um, great. I mean, there, there's a lot with solar. You know, I'm just not that familiar with the biomass specific. If it's piggybacking on e energy in general, yeah, but the solar ones are constantly threatened to be taken off the table. Um, so we'll okay. get that resource to whoever asked that question. Kathy, if I might chime in, when you say use the word biomass, we have to be a good because focus on are we saying biomass woody biomass and are we saying biomass in general because there is a biomass epa federal funding but if it falls under food waste animal waste they fall that falls under biomass but i think your question is about woody biomass is that what i'm, if I'm am i right yes great point gary thank you you're welcome good distinction let me ask you can you share a little bit with the audience about access to the t-rec in maryland is there a contact that they would go to to find out more about uh, if they're doing a project to uh, utilize the T-REC uh, incentive in Maryland? Well, I can touch based on what um, this is not, this is a part where I think the PSC is more involved in that. What I understand is that for those who's listening, we're interested in T-RECs, is that the, the PSC has not received uh, one application as far as for a, a T-Rex when it comes to woody biomass because I want to make sure we distinguish in what we're discussing here woody biomass so it has not been one application through T-Rex so that's go through the PSC now um, 
I mentioned in 2016, we attempted to do a, a woody uh, biomass program and those programs never went into fruition from the grantees. So I can't give you a definite answer right now because we don't have precedence to show one because there has not been an application per se to the PSC, but it is there, but it has to take one viable project to take advantage of that so we can see what the outcome of that's gonna be. And you would be available to assist a project developer in finding that the access to the TREC person at PSC? I'll be more than happy to assist as all that I can. <laughs> that's great, thank you, thank you. Of course. Uh, we're getting close to our time. Um, I um, wanted to, I've got one more question um, that uh, wanted to know, will there be some work toward redefining redeveloping or redefining the T-REC -T um, and I, I w I'm throw that out there for Gary I guess if you have any thoughts on that. Well um, we do have a policy team and, and at, at MEA and I am part of, of working to try to um, uh, we can't redefine T-REC so this is go to the PSC but we are offering our suggestions in terms of that. Uh, but there, I think in this coming fiscal year, uh, we do have a team that put together ways we can try to redefine it. But then again, it goes back to that question, Kath, is that uh, the PSC can only use or make determination based on what is on a statute, unless some of the statute um, is changes, um, unless someone goes back to my point, unless someone apply for the T-Rex, Thermorex application, that's the only way you can actually make changes because you have to have a decision before you require to make changes. Right. Uh, as of right now, we don't have any decisions, so it's hard to make to require to make a change if you don't show there's a rejection of a Demorex application. Okay. Well, let's move quickly to our last two live polling questions before we wrap up. Question number three: How has today's session impacted your thoughts on biomass energy? please select all that apply. Remember to answer a poll question, click on the radio button next to your answer and then click submit. And after a few seconds, the magic poll results appear. Great, we have broader perspective, thank you. And question number four, is your company or organization interested in developing a biomass energy project in the future? Remember to click the radio button next to your choice, select all that apply, and then hit submit. And the results are... Okay, we have a couple that are interested. Great. So we've reached the end of our time today. I'd like to thank all of our guest speakers and webinar attendees for your participation. When attendees exit the, sem the webinar, Zoom will open a survey page for your browser. Please submit the form to ensure that we have your correct information for continuing education credit, reporting, and verification. If you need assistance reporting continuing education hours, please email us at info at mdcleanenergy.org. The recording for today's webinar and previous sessions can be found at uh, the website mdcleanenergy.org. And a white paper produced as part of the Spurring Fossil Free Biomass Initiative can be found on that website along with the recordings from the earlier sessions. Once again, thank you everyone, have a great day.